Hey folks, today I'm back with another video about the Milton Glaser lecture, what I have learned. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there's a link down below uh, in the video description to the first video in this series where I talk in, in the introduction in detail about it. But the basic idea is that it is a lecture given by the graphic designer and artist Milton Glaser back in 2002, where he had 10 bullet points of wisdom that he wanted to share with his audience. And I have found a tremendous amount to mine out of these bullet points vis-a-vis -vis my my uh, own personalized career as a, as a science fiction fantasy author. And today I want to talk about bullet point number nine, which is solving the problem is more important than being right. And the first two paragraphs of, of this part of the lecture are worth reading in full. Ultimately, if we're lucky, we begin to understand that always being right is a delusion. There is a significant sense of self-righteousness in both the art and design world. Perhaps it begins at school. Art school often promotes the Ayn Rand model of the single personality resisting the ideas of the surrounding culture. The theory is that as an individual, you can transform the world, which is true up to a point, but as someone once said, in the battle between you and the world, bet on the world. One of the signs of a damaged ego is absolute certainty. Schools encourage the idea of not compromising and defending your work at all costs. Well, in our work, the issue is usually all about the nature of compromise. You just have to know when compromise is appropriate. Blind pursuit of your own ends, which excludes the possibilities that others may be right, does not allow for the fact that in design, we're always dealing with a triad, the client, the audience, and you. And I thought about how this might apply to what I'm doing, and I said, okay, well, the triad that he's talking about in my circumstances would be myself, the audience, and the work itself. And there are many times when I have looked at what I am doing in a story where I'm trying to, I'm trying to create something new and, you know, exotic and original. And I will say to myself, you know, what's, what's really going to serve the story here? Is being, is being more fantastic going to serve this story? Or is being more realistic and, and more humble uh, with my intentions and, and my aims going to serve the story better? As I am recording this, um, one of the things that I am working on and I'll be working on later this evening after, after I turn off the camera, is a book that I have torn down and rewritten, I think at this point, twice. I'm in the middle of what amounts to the third draft. And a big part of why I found myself stopping and tearing everything apart and sticking it back together again was because I kept running into this problem where I, would, I, I had these ideas that I thought were really, I thought were really wonderful. And I had this writing that I thought was a really wonderful expression of it, you know, that was, that was really exciting and, you know, really vibrant writing. And then I realized that all of this was just basically compensation for the fact that there were significant parts of the story that just did not work. Where I would look at them, I would be in the middle of a scene and I would say to myself, why is it this way? Why don't they just... You know, why don't they just do this? It's what I call the, an example of what I call the why don't they just shoot him problem. If you find yourself saying that to yourself about, about a story you're working on, why don't they just shoot him, then that's probably a warning sign. That's a smell, as they say in some circles. That's a sign that things are not working and that the way that you have approached your story is dysfunctional and that you need to back up and start over. Or at the very least, you need to back up to the point before when you started asking yourself, why don't they just shoot him? So I started asking myself more and more of these questions, and finally I just stopped and said, okay, I've got, to, I've got to go back, I've got to tear the story down to the studs and figure out what's really going on here and figure out how I can actually express it. And what bugged me was that I had to throw out a lot of things. I had to throw out a lot of stuff that I thought was really well-written and that beautifully embodied so many of the things that I was trying to do. But, they were, but what I was trying to do was missing the mark. So they were these really beautiful expressions of something that just wasn't correct for the story. And I found in the end, as, as, I, as I started the rewriting process, that I was able to keep a lot of the text. I was able actually to keep a lot of individual things that I really liked because they could be repurposed. They could be put into service of this, of this new end that I had in mind. And I said to myself, at the end of the day, I'm going to have a better story. You know, solving the problem of making the story better by not succumbing to the temptation of making it that much flashier, by not succumbing to the temptation of having the flash and the filigree, as they like to say, um, carry the story, that's going to be more important. That's going to be far more important than patting myself on the back and saying, yeah, I really wrote something flashy there. Because at the end of the day, that doesn't, that doesn't support weight. Um, 
I've always I've always had a lot of trouble uh, reconciling my feelings about about being a, being spectacular as a writer. You know, really having this uh, commanding kind of presence on the page. What 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 the critic Roger Sale once referred to as the imperial mode of writing novels. You know, where the where the author says, "This is reality as I as I declare it. Take it or leave it." Your ticket has been punched. You're going to take the ride. And some of the examples he gave of this were people like um, Thomas Pynchon or uh, Kurt Vonnegut. You know, these are these are people who are basically in inventing and dispensing truth and reality as they see fit. And I used to think of myself in that mold a whole heck of a lot. But as I started doing work in that mold and finding myself unhappy with it and saying, "This isn't not this is not doing what I want it to do. This isn't hitting what I aimed for." And so I had to tear all of that down and say, okay, what, what am I really trying to do here? What's the problem that I'm trying to solve by way of this story? And that forced me to put my ego in the background a little bit and, and to think about what my real intentions were. So this, this business of solving the problem, being more important than being right, it's a hard lesson. And it really has, it has, it has this additional degree of weight when you're writing SF and fantasy, because there's always the temptation in SF and fantasy to let you know, the elaborateness of your setting or the inventiveness of your ideas or the complexity of your of, of your world do all the heavy lifting for you. And the simple truth is that it can't. It can lift only so much. At the end of the day, there, st there still has to be story in there. There still has to be people that we give a darn about and that we're willing to follow through this story from beginning to end. And at the end of it, we have to feel like the whole thing was worth it. We have to have some kind of emotional derivation from it that, that gives us satisfaction. And if that means putting some of our, our clever or, you know, more imperial tendencies on the shelf for a bit, so be it. So that's what I got out of, of bullet point number nine, solving the problem is more important than being right. And in other videos, I may talk about a couple more of the of these bullet points from Milton Glaser's lecture. But for now, see what you think of that one and see you around.